Okay, let's keep uh, let's keep moving. Uh, next, we're going to hear for if you look at our schedule, we're uh, halfway through our afternoon session. Uh, next, we're here from Ludwig Herman from ESPP. Ludwig works as a senior researcher and advisor at ProMan Management Incorporated, which designs, develops, manages, and evaluates innovation, research, and development projects for business policymakers and nonprofit organizations. He's president and member of the board of the European Sustainable Phosphorus Platform, which is the European equivalent of the Phosphorus Alliance. He is a member of the Scientific Advisory Committee of the Federal Institute of Materials Research and Testing in Berlin, of the Steering Committee, the International Water Association's Resource Recovery Cluster in The Hague, and an expert groups dealing with plant nutrition, protection of soil, water, and management of critical raw materials on behalf of the European Commission in Brussels. And so we're very uh, pleased and happy to have Ludwig here with us to share developments from Europe. Yeah. Many thanks for having me here, and I'm, I'm pleased to talk to you and to compare your uh, US experiences with the European experiences. And I think the problems are quite similar, and the solutions uh, would be as well. So I'm going to the wrong direction, apparently. Here we are. Uh, so uh, ESPP is the equivalent, as we already discussed, or as Jim said, uh, to uh, SPA, uh, it is the European Sustainable Phosphorus Platform, it has about 50 paying members uh, from different sectors, industry, science, uh, municipalities, regions, so quite uh, a diverse membership. And our action is focused on moderating processes and making uh, products, particularly recycling products, available on the market. And how do you do that? By uh, trying to get uh, legislation and regulation in line with the possibilities of the industry and of the recyclers that you have. And uh, we are frequently acting also as dissemination partners for uh, European research projects. We have an 82,000 uh, members mailing list, which is quite uh, quite an achievement. And uh, we know that about between 11 and 40 percent of these mails are at least open if they are read. So I hope some of them will also be read. But this is quite a good instrument for dissemination. And uh, you see here a number of regulatory dossiers that are currently uh, discussed in Europe, and we have uh, recently turned to have public consultations on such uh, subjects, and uh, we always uh, collect opinions from our members and then feed into these public consultations and try to get uh, uh, results that are uh, feasible for uh, the uh, public, for our members, but also for the environment. And uh, well, we, uh, what, what did we achieve or why is it good to have such a platform? And in Europe, we have seen at least during the last couple of years, three countries that made phosphorus recycling mandatory. So uh, in Switzerland, Germany and Austria, you will soon have to recycle phosphorus from uh, sewage sludge mainly, but in Switzerland also from uh, animal uh, residues, from slaughterhouse residues. Uh, we are, and this is quite new, and I have had to send a few uh, updates to Matt, because uh, last week uh, we had a number of new publications uh, in regard to wastewater treatment in Europe, and I wanted to include that in our presentation here. Uh, and of course, we have a huge achievement, which is a fertilizing product regulation that covers uh, mineral and recycled products, mineral and organic products, so covering the whole market and gives uh, an, or opens a pathway for recycled products to the European market. Uh, we're also dealing with organic farming and we are organizing conferences. We are managing a technology catalog and uh, you see here 
uh, it contains the description, the overall description of certain uh, or of, let's say, we try to cover all technologies that come up and even the research projects and uh, not very mature approaches. Uh, and we cooperate, among others, with the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance here, but also with other platforms in Europe and in Japan and in Canada. Uh, okay, so uh, what is the policy framework in Europe? Uh, we have uh, the European Green Deal that came up in 2021, uh, and it includes and it covers the farm to fork strategy, a biodiversity strategy, a chemical strategy, a zero pollution action plan, and the circular economy action plan. And uh, it states that uh, you can have legal requirements to boost the market for secondary raw materials. So it means you don't only offer them or enable them, you also should push them a little bit. And you see a lot of links in my presentation, so it will be distributed and there's a lot of words there but the advantage is you can uh, click on these links and you will find the original documents and can uh, deepen your knowledge. Uh, so the farm to fork strategy is the core of this Green Deal in terms of agricultural policies. And its aim is to mitigate soil, air and water pollution by increasing the nutrient use efficiency. And the European approach is that we have to reduce losses. Uh, and we should reduce losses uh, of nutrients by 50% by 2030, a very ambitious goal, I would say, probably not, not achievable, uh, but also by developing integrated nutrient management plans by the member states. So this is a member state task and currently the member states are working on these nutrient management plans. And uh, also a little bit controversial uh, aim is to have 25% of agricultural land under organic farming, which under current conditions will reduce the nutrient use efficiency. So there is a certain contradiction there. And of course, bio-based fertilizers, new business models, and so on and so on. And it will have, of course, an impact, or we have uh, this, this legislation uh, creates an impact on uh, emissions on one hand, but also on the agriculture. And uh, we have currently emissions of about 10% of greenhouse gases, of which 70% are from livestock. And we see already the first implications. Uh, the farmers in the Netherlands, which is one of the problematic countries in Europe, are very upset because the government seriously proposes to reduce the livestock by 20% approximately, because otherwise it is not manageable. So what you said, you have to, you have to reduce the livestock density uh, to get to uh, meaningful solutions. It's not only feasible by technical uh, progress or technical implementations. And what is included, and uh, these European payments, and we, we are talking about the figures, the US figures, Europe pays in five years, 270 million billion euros to farmers. Uh, it's one dollar is one euro more or less. So you have about, uh, let's say, uh, 270 billion. So it's 50 billion more or less per year that goes uh, into payments uh, for farmers. And you have on top of that about 110, 120 billion that goes into uh, let's say, land or, or agricultural areas development. So these are not payments to farmers, but regional improvements. And of these 270 million, 25% have to go to increasing, uh, so that this first pillar that is on the slide is biodiversity related. So you need to spend 25% of this 50 billion per year to uh, measures that improve the overall situation, nutrient losses, biodiversity, everything that we were talking about before. Uh, and of course, we have also other policies in place 
like the Water Framework the Directive, the Urban Wastewater Directive, Sewage Sludge Directive, and so, and so on, Circular Economy Action Plan, Chemicals Strategy, Zero Pollution Action Plan, and uh, the Circular Economy. And uh, these uh, activities started in 2015, and there was the first uh, EU publication or consultation about uh, uh, the uh, sustainable use of phosphorus. And uh, in uh, 2015, uh, also the circular, the first circular economy action plan was born. And uh, the commission started to develop this new uh, fertilizing product regulation that is definitely a milestone in European policies. Uh, because this fertilizing product regulation uh, confers an end of waste status. You may know these problems related if you have, uh, when you have residues, are they waste, are they byproducts, are they, so uh, a product that is compliant with this uh, uh, fertilizing product regulation and gets the CE mark is definitely not a waste anymore in all European countries. And the idea was to open the market for recycling fertilizers. The idea was also to enhance uh, the uh, development and the production of, uh, let's say, technical solutions. So, of course, we talked about reduction, but also we talk about technical solutions, products that are more uh, appropriate uh, to convert uh, manure, for example, to transportable products that can be used in regions where they are not in excess, like uh, struvite, for example. Uh, so we have all these uh, efforts and uh, there is a, a continuous development in, in this regulation. Uh, we had, uh, in the beginning, we have uh, 15 uh, component material categories and we have seven product function categories. So these two elements are uh, essential in this legislation. And uh, now we have opened a consultation and we got about 200 proposals for new uh, component materials. So of course this will not all be categories, but you see there is a lot of movement in the market and a lot of activity. Uh, so, uh, as I said, CE mark fertilizers can be used everywhere. And uh, essentially, you have to have a component that is listed in this legislation. And you have to uh, produce a product that has a function that is listed in this legislation. And uh, both together, uh, then accompanied by other uh, activities like reach registration and labeling and so on, and the conformity assessment uh, may guarantee that you have a, a product that you can bring on the market. Here you see on the left hand the product function categories and on the right hand you see the current component material categories. Uh, you see here uh, an in and out uh, table and you see that for example manure is still a, a, a critical a component material because uh, it's not depending on one uh, uh, directorate in, in Europe and uh, the DG Agri and the DG Santé that are responsible for uh, opening the market for manure uh, have been s slower than DG Grow. So uh, this is currently uh, coming in. Uh, there are proposals uh, which uh, Animal byproducts, so animal byproduct, everything, manure is the most prominent flow uh, within this animal, animal byproduct term. Uh, and currently it's not yet open, but we will soon get some products uh, being included. You have here a table. I will not talk about the details of this table. And what is important and what also has been uh, promoted and introduced with this, uh, let's say, new uh, fertilizing product regulation was that you can always talk to the regulators, 
but you have to come up with, uh, uh, let's say, convincing evidence. So you cannot just say, well, my product is the best and uh, you have to provide robust scientific evidence that your product is safe and has a function, function depending on what uh, category it is used, in what category it is used. It should be a fertilizer or it can be a growing media or it can be a soil improver, but there must be a function that serves uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, overall agricultural activities. Um, we have, uh, of course, uh, be below this European coverage. We have national fertilizer regulations, and I mentioned already we have now three countries that have introduced an obligation to recycle phosphorus uh, from sewage sludge and from uh, slaughterhouse residues in Switzerland. The other two countries have it only from sewage sludge. Uh, and the, uh, let's say, organic farming is also now uh, a little bit slowly, but they are accepting or there is now a consultation underway that's true white, that is one of these recycled products, uh, a product precipitated from uh, phosphorus, magnesium and nitrogen uh, from usually the liquid phase of manure or of sewage sludge or whatever uh, can be used also in organic farming. The, uh, let's say, characteristic of several of these products is that they are not water soluble. Uh, so strobite is a non-water soluble, but still uh, plant available product and uh, some may expect that this could also contribute to a better uh, behavior or to a lower uh, pollutant uh, uh, generation. Yeah, here is this uh, public consultation. And uh, talking about the challenges and the opportunities and the improvements that we can have. Uh, so uh, maybe we need radical business models. And here I'm talking about a, a tendency, about a discussion that we have at various levels. So why do we always, and this is one of the problems that we see, uh, we, every company wants to sell uh, many tons of fertilizers. This is the current business models, sell more. And no CEO will ever be happy if the next year you don't come up as a salesman with a higher sales volume. Uh, so instead of having this model, shouldn't we have a model that is called resources as a service or a product as a service? Uh, so instead of looking at tons of fertilizers or of nutrients sold, why don't we look at the soil fertility and uh, uh, let's say promise or the, 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 the service provider promises a hectare or an, uh, an acre of fertile soil. This could be an alternative. So we should, uh, let's say, develop our, our fantasy or, or work with our fantasy and see what we could uh, develop in terms of new business models that do not exercise this pressure that we currently have, because we have a pressure, companies have a pressure to sell more. Uh, we talked a lot about soil erosion as one of the uh, problems uh, in, in, uh, in associated with uh, fertilizer and particularly phosphorus losses. And uh, in, in Finland, they have done a, let's say, extensive 10 years uh, study exercise with many farmers, I think 1,500 farmers were involved, uh, to use phosphor gypsum as a soil improver. And uh, Paolo knows uh, in, in Brazil, every ton of phosphor gypsum produced is, is used. Uh, and uh, the results are overall very good, not only for soil improvement, but also uh, deeper rooting and many other advantages that you can 
have better drought resistance of uh, plants, uh, but uh, still in, in the US, it's not allowed currently. So you have to talk to US, US EPA uh, to find, a, let's say, overall joint uh, uh, solution for uh, how, how much uh, radiation, how much uh, pollutants are tolerable. Uh, because we cannot always say zero pollution does not exist. We always need a, an adjustment at a tolerable amount. Of course, it costs money. It's also something that needs to be uh, subsidized because in, in Finland, the price is about 220 uh, euros per hectare. Uh, so a hectare is two and a half acres approximately. Uh, so you can imagine it, it has a cost and uh, farmers will not do it uh, without being uh, incentivized. Uh, so we also suggest to our industry partners and uh, uh, Fertilizers Europe uh, has uh, most of industries of European uh, phosphorus industries as partners. Uh, and we also uh, incentivize or try to incentivize them uh, to uh, come up with uh, uh, new solutions, new proposals. And this is one of my uh, favorite farm pictures. The upper picture is uh, an Italian farm uh, by uh, in, 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 19, in 2006. And the lower picture is the same farm in 2018. And what the farmer has done was really reinstalled the biodiversity, losing productivity but the economic result of this farm is more or less the same. So the, the output is lower, uh, the input is also lower, so the economic result is the same. And of course, it's now a, a bird and, and, and insect paradise. So you can do it. Uh, if you do it with scientific, there's a lot of scientific background behind that. So uh, back to uh, ESPP, we are organizing in January, uh, an uh, organic uh, fertilizers webinar and conference in Brussels. We are uh, organizing one day for nitrogen recovery. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. So factory farm um, manure can't be considered an organic? Uh, no, the CE program? not at all, not at all. And this will not change. So they will not allow a uh, factory farm derived uh, manure based products uh, for organic farming. Not now and not in the future. And what percentage of the manure does that exclude? Well, that's a good question. Uh, a large part, definitely. So that's just it. They're, they're, yeah. they're not really interested in, yes. in yeah. and what happens to that waste? What do you mean? Uh, when, what, what the organic, well, I mean, usually where you have a huge uh, a share of factory farming, you have a low share of organic farming. Uh, so, uh, well, if, if you want to develop organic farming in Flanders, for example, or in the Netherlands, uh, where uh, the reduction of uh, factory farming is now uh, an, a, a government uh, target. Uh, uh, it can be combined somehow, but uh, of course, uh, there is a long transitory pathway to do that. So I have a question. I'm glad you uh, brought up the uh, CO2 emissions factor, uh, because I had asked the earlier presenter, uh, Sylvia or Jonathan, you know what the emissions factor is, the CO2 equivalents for producing a ton of uh, phosphate fertilizer? Yes, um, kiloton? The, the emission of uh, phosphorus uh, fertilizer production is not high. So we are talking about uh, one, one ton approximately of uh, CO2 uh, per ton of fertilizer. So this is more or less uh, a figure that you can think about. Uh, if you have triple super or so, it's slightly more, but uh, uh, the usual uh, equivalent is about one ton. 
Okay, a question from Mentimeter. It says, I saw biochar listed as a regulated product. Does that include manure de derived biochars? And if such were used for non agriculture purposes, is it regulated in the same manner? Uh, biochar is currently uh, exclusively uh, uh, authorized for a small number of input materials, mainly plant derived materials. Uh, sewage and manure derived biochar is not feasible currently uh, and as I said before you cannot use currently any manure for any of these products except and, and there is uh, an uncertainty in answers from different directorates in Europe uh, we have uh, if you produce uh, if you strip ammonia and you produce ammonium sulfate or ammonium nitrate. Uh, so we have, uh, let's say, in writing different answers from different directorates that say this is not manure derived because it comes from the gases phase and this is a quest, a new product, so to say. Uh, so if, if this holds true and we are uh, investigating this question with other directorates that we get a, let's say, a, a, a synchronized opinion from different uh, EU uh, organizations, uh, then you will be able to use this stripped ammonia and produce ammonium fertilizers out of it. Uh, Ludwig, thanks for your, for your presentation. Uh, considering the, the, the idea of a circular economy, what do you think is the future, considering the, the Brazil, for example, produces a lot of uh, food and is sent to Europe, uh, you, uh, USA also produces a lot of food and sent to other countries. What do you think you should do for recycling or considering the circular economy for nutrients in general, especially for phosphorus? Well, I think uh, the uh, one low-hanging fruit is, for example, uh, recycling sewage-based nutrients. So that comes out from sewage plants. And of course, there is the first step that we have a tertiary treatment that we remove phosphorus and nitrogen from, uh, from the wastewater, and then we can recycle it. And uh, usually the uh, financing of these activities uh, is easier than uh, financing farming, uh, recycling from, from farming, uh, because you have always a cost associated with recycling. It's never free of charge, otherwise we would do it. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, so it's always uh, has a certain additional cost. And in wastewater treatment plants, citizens pay a wastewater treatment fee and it's acknowledged at least in high income countries as services that we we want to have we want to have uh, treated wastewaters and uh, we pay a certain amount of money and if we improve this uh, removal uh, commission has now calculated that increasing the removal efficiency from 90 to 95 percent in the larger plants uh, and including several other measures will cost 2.3 percent of the wastewater treatment. So increasing the wastewater treatment cost by 2.3 percent is not a huge uh, expense and uh, could be implemented. While uh, doing the same with the farming sector will be much more difficult. So I think the wastewater treatment sector should go forward should go ahead. We have also a lot of public municipal wastewater treatment where it is easier. And at least we see that, that in, in Germany, in Austria and Switzerland, where wastewater treatment frequently is a public uh, task. And uh, municipalities, if they are incentivized or forced by law, uh, start doing it and uh, it's happening. So we see this in Europe as a, as a continuous development and we see much less in, we see also agricultural recycling activities. Uh, 
but we see it in countries where also the legislation is strict, like in, in the Netherlands, when you cannot use your manure in the neighborhood because uh, you have a P and an N limit there, uh, they drive it 300 kilometers or 400 kilometers. Uh, and to drive it 300 or 400 kilometers, uh, it has a cost and you start thinking of how can you dry it, how can you separate solid liquid, how can you remove nutrients, and then uh, farmers are doing something. And, and yes, uh, it's also frequently related to anaerobic digestion, because if you have an anaerobic digester, digester then you can add on different recycling technologies. Thank you, Ludwig.